Greetings, growers worldwide. Jordan River here, back with Crowcast. <laughs> That's right, Crowcast. Today we have Mary Beth Sanchez. She's a team member. She's in our Discord all the time. She is just wonderful. She's an IPM expert and a regenerative soil specialist. She's here today to talk mostly about pests, but we drift into all sorts of different aeration topics and more. Why do I get? Why do I even need to set it up? You guys know her. You love her. She's here. She's back. Before we get into it, though, let's talk about the microbiometer. That's right. You can now get a count on the living bacterial and fungal microbes within your soil or your compost tea, and you can get that test for as little as $10 a test right at home in a few minutes. With the microbiometer, use code GROWCAST for 15% off your microbiometer at microbiometer.com. That's microbiometer.com. Again, test your soil. Is it as living as you think it is? Did you just do a drench and you need to see if it's time to re-inoculate? Did you just add fish shit and you want to see how well it's taken? Did you just add some king crab and you want to see if that number is higher? You want to test your compost tea to see if it's still alive? Buy a microbiometer and stay tuned for some killer content from me and more importantly, from Mary Beth herself on the microbiometer. Code GROWCAST, of course. Thank you for partnering with us and stay tuned for some great content there. All right, but enough of that. Let's get to this. Mary Beth Sanchez, thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River. I want to thank you for tuning in to the show again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to share the show. Tell a grower about the show. It's how we grow. It's how we spread. It's the best thing you can do. If we've helped you in your garden, help me out. Tell someone about Growcast. Available everywhere, Spotify, iTunes, whatever you're listening on. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you guys spreading the show. Also, hit up growcastpodcast.com slash membership for the greatest membership in cultivation. Uh, we've got the Discord for members solving everyone's problems. We've got the Growcast TV le- weekly live stream. If you've seen Growcast TV, go and check it out, everybody. We urge you, thank you, to the members of Growcast membership. Speaking of membership, uh, you'll find Mary Beth Sanchez in the Plant Problems and IPM channels constantly helping people sharing their successes, celebrating, and uh, we have none other than Mary Beth Sanchez on the line. What's up, Mary Beth? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. You sound great. Oh, swell. Can we open with a thank you for all you do for members? Uh, I I know you do get a lot of adulation in the chat because you do help so many people, but here's a thank you from me for always holding it down, answering people's questions, and um, solving people's garden issues more specifically. Well, I always feel bad if I can't get back to them right away, but sometimes I'm out of range and all I've got is a cell phone up in the mountains. And so sometimes I'm out of range. And so I feel like, oh no. Oh my God, you're so well, prompt. Are you kidding me? She usually responds instantly. I, I told her, turn off the notifications, but they're going to be tagging you all day. She usually <laughs> responds instantly. Um, but yeah, you get at them real quick. Well, they, you know, sometimes people are in a panic when they get, you know, an issue and you don't want to, yeah. you know, be making them wait while they're in a panic wondering what's going to happen to my plant. That's actually a really good point, Mary Beth. I think that would be a good place to start. Uh, we're talking about pests today, but what you just pointed out is so true. Hmm. When you discover, especially if it's something like really uh, that progresses very quickly, like if you discover an infestation or if you discover like a really bad fungal issue with your plant, you go into this panic mode and this like adrenaline mode yeah. where if someone tells you like, oh yeah, I got the answer. Just hang on. I'll, I'll, I'll text you right back. You're going to be checking that <laughs> phone like crazy. In, in reality, you should probably just stay calm, start researching yeah. what you can, right? There's right. no sense in panicking and, and um, for instance, rushing to the first opinion. I don't think an hour is going to make much difference now that you've noticed those spider mite webs. You treat it, right. you know, you treat it as soon as you can. Well, that's such a good point. Your average grower's head starts to spin out, doesn't it? Oh, God, yeah. And and you feel their pain because you've been there before. A hundred percent. But it's easy to act too quickly and accidentally kill off something that was actually a beneficial predator or some sort of beneficial member of the soil that you would have, you know, been better off letting them thrive you know it, it, people That's like true. people frequently see columbula and and freak out thinking of, that they have root aphids or some kind of terrible mite and and they quickly run to try to kill it and thankfully it's pretty tough it's hard to kill boy it's good at reproducing so um <laughs> they usually are frustrated that they can't seem to kill it there's zillions 
then when you reassure them, well, that it's really a, a beneficial insect. Don't freak out. It you're you got the good guys. You're doing something right. You know. Oh my God, that's they, so true. The relief. Oh my gosh, the relief. Um, the other thing I love about Discord too is that we get so many different people on there, and they all, like you say, you get second opinions, third opinion, fourth opinion, and then you can really figure things out because oftentimes, you know, I'll, even myself, the infallible one, you know, <laughs> uh, will will sometimes say like, "Oh, that looks like such and such to me," but somebody else will chime in and say, "But what about?" And I go, "Oh, you know what? You're right. I think it, that's you could be oh, right." A thousand percent. It takes a village, so, especially like, yeah, over the internet. And, it's harder, so it takes it, a village. Yeah. And I don't see a lot of attitude, you know, I see a lot of good attitude. Oh, well, a lot thank of, you. Of e- egotistical crap. And so it's very, it's, it's like a really neat community. Nice. Well, thank cool you for to saying be part that. of. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mary Beth. <laughs> thank you. Uh, kind of circling back though, to what you just said a second ago, this is, I think I've shared this on the podcast before, but I'll just share it again. Kind of funny. Mm. You talk about acting rashly when <laughs> something changes in your garden yeah. and maybe it isn't even a pest. Yeah. I remember the first time my Bokashi got a really good bloom on it. I was like, oh shit, what's going on with my soil? There's mold yeah. everywhere. And you have that instinct, reach for the zymes. Well, let's flush it right now. And I said, wait a reach second. for something. Yeah, let me see what this is first. And uh, texted some smarter people, I'm sure you, and you uh, go. and got the answer back. They said, did you use Bokashi recently? That white fuzzy mold that's is, is right. usually a good thing. And if you use Bokashi, that's where it came from. So More than likely. <laughs> yeah. Pretty funny. The good stuff. Yeah. And. Thankfully, uh, if you if you get into fungus, that's another whole universe. <laughs> but boy, they have a lot of good things there to help you in your garden. Things that really help the plants and ones that actually kill insects for you. Oh, so nice. they can be uh, a really good friend if you have a serious issue going on that you can't seem to get anything else to work with. You know, hit with the Bavaria bassiana or the the Met 52, I don't know if you've heard of Met 52. That's a different kind of a... It acts similarly to the Bavaria Bassiana. If you've ever seen pictures of the insects affected with it, they kind of look like they're covered with a thick sort of cottony, uh. moldy looking stuff. And the similar thing happens with the Met 52. That's the the shortened version. I think it's Metahysium, uh, something like that. <laughs> It's some kind of a fungus with a you know a long Latin name, but Met Fifty Two is the uh, Brand. trade name nice. that you could buy it under. But there's these kind of things, you know. We I don't like to necessarily put them out unless I have a serious issue because they can affect insects that I might not want right. affected. So I don't want to get too crazy with them. But you know, if you've got an indoor situation, jeez. You know, like Brandon Rust really recommends them, but he's usually growing indoors. You know, he's got huge indoor garden things. Yeah. When you've done the vagaries of the weather, you get more and more inclined to want to go indoors. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. But, <laughs> this last season was rough on so many growers. Yeah, oh, boy. I at least want to want to get a uh, covered thing so that if it's raining <laughs> or frosting or hailing, I don't necessarily have to go into a panic mode. You know, oh, I don't have man. to have it all closed up and totally temperature controlled, but if I can at least keep falling objects off, <laughs> that's helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no kidding. This this last winter was just, or I mean, fall, I guess, was just uh, brutal. In so many ways. Yeah, if you weren't frying or, or on fire, you were flooding or the snow yeah. or the hail or the hurricanes or what fire on your left and Sheesh. hail on your right it's a fun time uh-huh. literally between a rock and a hard place um the last thing you want to do is is throw in pests nope. that's just the the nope. unholy trinity oh weather mold and insects i think that's the unholy oh, trinity man. technically you know i've been dealing with thrips a while now i've sent you some nasty pictures i don't send you the worst pictures because because of, of my embarrassment oh, those no, those are terrible. Well, because they have the underground cycle and the above ground cycle and they're just really good at hiding and thriving and finding ways around all of our little defenses. So no kidding. You, really, you have to keep like treating them even when you don't see them because they're probably just underground at that point. Yeah, that's definitely what <laughs> or happened hiding to on the, Yeah, hiding on the nearby trees. So if you shake up the nearby trees, they might just go settle on your garden. Those kind of things happen a lot. That's super People interesting. People will frequently report like, you know, oh, my neighbor mowed his field and suddenly I've got an infestation. They go, well, that guess where they all went? To the living plants, the beautiful living plants. And 
it's a, Oi! Yeah. you think I've Oy been vey. doing all these good things and I've been on top of it and suddenly I'm overwhelmed. Well, that's yeah. Too much all at once. Yeah. I guess the too much all at once applies to my situation. You know, I never saw a thrip once in Humboldt County. I got broad mites. Oh. I got root aphids. I got uh, spider mites. I, I never saw a thrip one time. And then back here in Illinois, I uh, brought some outdoor plants inside. Maybe you've heard this on the podcast before. I got some thrips in my tent. But you know yeah. what I ended up doing, Mary Beth? And I think this is kind of like you were saying. I was just kind of living with them mm-hmm. like a low grade right. infestation. I was I was spraying my normal IPM protocols. I thought they were gone. I would occasionally see a leaf with damage and I'd be like, oh shit, you know what I mean? And I'd pick it and I'd spray extra hard the next day. But right. I never did hard root <laughs> drenches. I never, I never did that full nuclear measure. Right. And then fast forward, I got those headaches and I was down and out for a little while. And that oh, low grade infestation, that low grade infestation had chance to take hold. And it's something you've exactly. said before. It's, it's the, the act of putting it out of balance. Like things were fine. They could have been better, but things were fine with a little bit of thrips. It was when I let them really establish. Yep. They go, it's a whole different, yep. it's a whole, it's a pandemic at this point. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And now that's when you want to do a hard reset. Like we've seen some pictures recently in the chats and things where, uh, well, like for instance, this one person, he had, he found like a sea of young spider mites. They were, you know, mostly in the younger larval stages. You could only see the beginnings of the spots on their sides and going, what the heck? Because he wasn't yeah. really seeing anything on the plants, but like, good Lord, there's so many. You just, did they, It's like all of a sudden, where'd they come from? <laughs> well, they're so invisible to the naked eye when they're young and they're so easy to overlook, especially when you really don't want to see that. So, you know, your focus isn't going there usually. You know, you want to go in optimistically thinking, it looks great, everything's great. We're going to will it to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see something that just makes your heart stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I guess the uh, first lesson of this episode is understanding the level of establishment that the infestation is at. And and you're right. A hard reset really comes in when they're so established that right. the war isn't worth it anymore. You got to go scorched right. earth. You got to go full exterminatus and just, <laughs> and just completely wipe right. out the... <laughs> the grow tent and especially with these invisible pests because you know they're not literally invisible but yeah. they're invisible to our naked eye and so they have such a opportunity to get really well established before you really notice them at all yeah that's true you know it's just the advantage which is what makes them worse than the big pests because the big pests you can come and you see that right yes. off you know you don't it's not going to get established before it can get really out of hand but these guys man you really don't see a lot of damage until you, when you do look and go, oh my Lord, yeah, I didn't shit. see that. And it's really out of control. The armies are at our gates. <laughs> yeah, especially if you don't, you know, some people such as myself, my eyesight isn't as sharp as it once was. And, you know, uh, you don't really get in there with your scope religiously, especially, uh, you know, I say, I, I want to say, especially on the lower leaves because things so often start down there, but you know, especially on the tips too, because that's usually where everything's migrating to, because that's where the tender new growth is. And that's the most delicious usually for the average little pasties. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. Especially if they're coming Mm -hmm. out of the soil I've found, they really snack Mm -hmm. on that, on that lower one as they move their way up. That's definitely what the thrips did. You know, you talk about bad eyesight. I have horrible eyesight, but but when I have my glasses on, I can see adult thrips. Yeah. Like you said, you know, you worry about broad mites, russet mites. These things are fucking invisible. Yeah. You can turn over your leaf and you can see a spider mite. You can stop and wait and watch it move a little bit and say, that's a living spider mite. And I would say that it's even easier to see a big, full-blown adult thrip. Oh, yeah. It almost looks like a tiny rice hole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's different varieties of those, too. And so they come oh. in different colors. And, sh- and so sure. some of them are more vivid and exciting than others. But all of them... Thrips have a lot of larval stages, oh, and God. most of them are pretty invisible to the naked eye. So most of their life, we don't really see them very much. And it's only until they get to be great big adults oh, God. that we suddenly go, what happened? 
that pisses me off so bad because because again i didn't go for a reset i probably could have i probably should have i ended up killing some of the plants but i saved the creature feature female i saved the cringe female i saved the voice of joyce and i had to do three dr zymes washes i was spraying every single day and then i would see an adult thrip after that and i'd be like are you fucking kidding me yeah where did you come from how did you survive this the devil himself it is (laughs) I don't want to speak out of turn. Correct me if I'm wrong, but so many pests kind of have their little zone, you know, like uh, if you get spider mites, they love that upper canopy. It's it's so easy to treat them because they're so oh, confined. Definitely. Do thrips yeah. kind of go everywhere? Like they, they breed in the uh, soil, they climb up the plant. Do they climb out of the pots and in the room? Like these things kind of cruise, don't they? Yeah, they go everywhere and they go quickly. They love warm weather. They really get excited when it's warm uh. and nothing's off limits. And <laughs> they usually start at the bottom but they usually work their way up pretty darn quickly yep. uh, and like i say they they're one of those real fast moving little things especially the adults you i mean you've probably noticed when you've looked at them whoa there they go yeah they can zip <laughs> yeah and usually you say that's a sign of like a predator but thrips kind of break not, that they're kind yeah, of the, they're the exception the to that rule yeah they do <laughs> right. they do zip around and and yeah the lower leaves got chewed up really bad and had bad damage but then i found when the adults got big you're right. They totally like the warmth because you would find those up on the top, oh, uh, on the top leaves. And and just for the listeners, yeah. this is something we've discussed on on membership before, and probably on this podcast. But you know, just because we are doing Growcast here, you can tell thrip damage. It is so recognizable to me. It is yeah, so yeah. Uh, unique. That stippling that is. It, yeah, it's it's it looks like um someone spat a loogie on your leaf. You've got this weird kind of <laughs> white sheen, or like someone skied it on on the top of your leaf. Right. And and it's different. Uh, the white dots of the mite, those kind of white. Pock right. bite mark different than that. Exactly. They're almost like little yeah. lines. Like I said, like someone was a <laughs> like spat a loogie on the top, a tiny little loogie on the top of your leaf, and you'll see those more and more and more, and that's thrip damage. Yeah, they'll call it silvering. It gives you kind ah, of a silver sheen because what they've done is they sort of rasp, like with a rasp, they scrape off all that green uh, chlorophyll-y stuff and under the side of the leaf, and so the top part of the tissue is still there, and, it, and what that leaves is sort of that coloration that you're talking about. Well, that's different from the mite that's more like poking a hole, poking a hole, poking a hole. Yeah, it looks a little different. Yeah, definitely recognizable. But yeah, if you look at the clover mite damage, it's mistaken for the thrip damage because it looks very similar, but oh, it, it runs in more of a linear loopy kind of almost like a like a leaf miner does but it looks like a leaf miner got together with a thrip and they <laughs> doing funny things <laughs> left a trail of <laughs> spooge you, all over yeah, the fucking it's like a loop de loop a connected little track weird spotted little trails yeah and <laughs> no. they're very and very much similar to the damage that you would see on either of those two insects together Yikes. And, um, I didn't know about the that clover That would be mite. a clover mite. Oh, yeah. Yikes. Oh, I, you know, you keep learning new things every day. <laughs> I wish I knew it all, but they keep throwing new ones at me. Yeah, they keep yeah, making new fancy ones. Recently. Holy Damn crap. That's, that's funny. <laughs> but if we can kind of wrap up the thrip exploration. Yes. And this will lead into our next point, but my understanding is that they breed primarily in the soil and they emerge from the soil and start to go from there. Yeah. They breed outside of the soil too, though, you said, right? Oh, well, yeah, they'll lay their eggs everywhere. But, you know, you got to treat them everywhere. If you're going to be successful with thrips, you've got to go above ground, below ground. you got to spray the pots. They're walking Jeez. all over the place. Ah, look, that's they're the demonic worst. little, oh boy, and they're tough. You know, I know what got like the little uh, two spot mites. They're very resilient, resistant, and they're like we are. You know, they're always finding a way against and around whatever we do. I've been telling people recently, you know how I love the Zymes, but I think it, it works really even better if you add a little teeny bit of Dr. Bronner soap to it. It like gives it the extra power mm. to break down those waxy coatings on the on the insect's bodies. And that's usually the insect's first defense is their waxy coatings. And most insects have them to different degrees. And it's easy for them to just go ahead and exude some more if they really think that that's the thing that's going to help them. But I think that, you know, the Dr. Symes works good by itself. The Bronner's works good by itself. But I think the two of them work better, really better together. I've been telling people, go with your Bronner's and then add a little like a teaspoon per gallon of the Bronner soap to the Zymes solution. Nice. Because it seems to just have the extra little kick that I can actually get a handle on them. 
where the resistant ones. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. And I don't have to really worry at all about being toxic to anything later. You know, anything that I'm going to eat, drink or, or smoke or whatever. It's all, it's all good. Those, neither of those products uh, scare me. Yeah, yeah, just some soap. Just some soap for some good washing. At at worst, yeah. (laughs) So adding that to the solution, a good idea. I did notice the Zymes killed the thrips. Uh, They are a soft-bodied insect, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. Easier to kill the infants than the adults. So that's Ah. why the preventative is always the best because then you get more of the younger stage before so many adults become present as they hatch out. I mean, I've had really good success with Dr. Zymes as my preventative. It's kind of like my gentle go-to one. Um, yeah. When I discover an infestation like that, I do tend to turn it up a notch um, just with soapy yes, or oily. Too. Yeah, oily yes, products like too. Mammoth Can Control is one that, uh-huh. I, that seemed to really hit those thrips well. But the Zymes is always good as like yeah. a wash too. Like after I've hit it with that, with that oil that I really don't want sitting on the plant for too long. For instance, if I'm spraying every day. That's when I'll mm-hmm. use an oil product and then next day the Zymes. And I feel that it kind of helps wash it off maybe a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Couldn't hurt because you don't want to use those oil <laughs> oil products repeatedly, as you said, right? Because that'll, that'll clog uh, the stomata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so. yeah I don't want to get too, yeah, too much buildup of anything. Something to keep in mind yeah. for the listeners there. But yeah, thrips have been my bane. Let's hope you don't have to go through thrips. I know they're very happy in the county I live in, that's for sure. I considered them a minor nuisance until I saw how bad they can get when they really get established. And I no longer say they're a minor yeah. nuisance. I'd, I'd put them no. in the medium category. <laughs> real, real pain in the butt. But yeah. it, you can be fine as long as you keep on top of them. But like you said, something goes wrong that you don't expect. Like you're suddenly you're down and out. You're sick. Yeah. Or you had to leave town for some unexpected thing, a family member, you know, whatever. Things come up. So, and that, I swear to God, it's like they're there waiting and they pounce. They say, oh, the cat's <laughs> they away. They hear the car start. The mice go play. <laughs> oh, they do. <laughs> like the cats and dogs when they watch you packing up to go. They know what's going exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> they hear the car roll out of the driveway and they go, you know. Damn it. Battle <laughs> positions. Do. Move, move, move. I swear. Holy uh-huh. shit. That's what it seems like. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, just sharing my my little personal anecdote there, which leads nicely into the point that I'd like to talk about next. And this is, again, backing out to a broader point, but still something very important. All right, we'll be right back with Mary Beth. But before that, the Foop. The Foop. FoopCanada.com. Find your organic fish poop-based nutrient line there. Use code GROWCAST15 for 15% off for a limited time. That's GROWCAST15. Foop Canna, baby. Uh, I've talked about their nutrient line before. They've gone through all the hoops to get it certified organic. That ain't easy. They did it. They've got a wonderful sweetener. That Foop sweetener is uh, powerful stuff. Not all sweeteners are created equally, baby. And the Foop sweetener has what you need in it. Get that full spectrum nutrient line in just a few bottles with the Foop. And don't sleep on their other products. They've got the Foop clone gel, my favorite clone gel. And also the Foop mist, a wonderful foliar applicant. With micro and macronutrients, it's full spectrum. It's also got plenty of fun foliar stuff added like aloe extract and a little bit of peppermint oil. And uh, there's a couple other things in there that are secret ingredients that aren't so secret. But it all adds up to a really powerful and effective foliar. I like to use it on my young seedlings or cuttings. Not too much because it is powerful. But go ahead and give it a try. Foop Mist. Code GROWCAST15 for 15% off at foopcana.com. Thank you. To the foop. Okay, let's get back to it with Mary Beth Sanchez. If you're dealing with any sort of insect and, and you, that you don't want in your garden, you know, pest insect, it's so important to understand how they breed, where they breed, and what their life cycles are. Because yeah. like I said, you know, people freak out about spider mites, and spider mites can get bad if you've seen those top colas yeah. covered in those webs before. You know what bad spider mites oh. look like. But one thing about spider mites is they're all localized. If you understand that they love the upper canopy, that's where they breed, that's where they live, and here's how long it takes them to reproduce, then that's how you formulate your whole strategy. Again, doesn't apply to something like the thrips. You can spray the canopies all you want, but you're not doing anything. So again, Mary Beth, it's about understanding where they breed, how they breed. Some are born pregnant like fungus gnats, and then also how long they, what their life cycles are. Right. And some of them thrive, thrive, thrive in the heat and the dryness and other ones like it cool and moist. Mm. And yes, you know, you got to deal with different things and 
different strategies that, you know, if you can understand each different pest that, you know, if you know you're going to be hit with this, that or the other, their life cycle is an important clue to getting ways to know where you can break that life cycle and stop the infestation, such as yes. the, the physical barrier, cutting off the access for the uh, fungus gnats or the flea beetles to go in and out of the soil. That'll break their life cycle and just, they, you, you won't have them anymore. Yep. They will not successfully be able to hatch out any more eggs. Hallelujah. You're done. Thousand percent. You, know, you're right. you didn't have to use any poison at all. But and again, that's because that a, because of an understanding that fungus gnats are born pregnant. They exit the soil oh and then usually God. they drop their eggs after that. So if you can just simply put a barrier that they can exit, but the eggs can't get back in, like some sort of fabric cloth, a, a thin layer both of dry ways. sand. That's right. Yeah, whatever it is. That's right. Oh, is it both ways? Can they can they get through sand? Oh yeah, they'll see. No, no. Well, exactly. The ones that were already in the soil, when you put the sand on, they're not going to be able to travel through it and come out. Oh, is that right? The ones that get laid on the top of it, they are not going to be able to hatch because they will dry up and die I really see. quickly. So both ways, yeah. they don't. They won't pass through that sand. They don't like the way it feels in their body. It's painful to them. That does make sense. I, I guess I thought that they could get through it because, you know, at the edges of your pots and things like that, you'll occasionally still see a flyer come up. But if you have a real infestation, well, see, that's what I'm always telling people to get, you know, completely cover that shit. Don't leave them a yeah. gap. Man. And I'll see way too often people show pictures and there's like, man, I can see soil all over that thing. You need to put more sand on that. That is not enough sand. Yeah, that, it, it's, it's a delicate <laughs> because you're game. leaving them doorways. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's a trick. And so, yeah, I know everything's a matter of. You you do the best you can. You can give them instructions, but you can't go there and do it for them. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, you know, it's weird, though, because also, you know, I love my fabric pots. I love my mesh pots even more. You know, I'm a I big do. fan of rain science throwbacks. Oh, but like you take a look them. at things like soil cover with sand and uh, yeah. you kind of mush the pot a little bit. And suddenly there's this huge gap in the side that's like exposing yeah. all that open soil. So that's tough. Yeah. And then and then you want to add you want to make sure when you're adding that sand and covering it that you're fully covering but also don't make it too thick. You know, Mary Beth, you've warned, right. you've warned about that hard pan yes. layer. I've experienced yes. that a couple of times now. Now that the seasons are changing and the humidity yeah. is changing, I really try to do rice holes unless I have a fungus gnat problem because I went to touch my sand top cover and it had done what you had warned. It had formed this um, this hard <laughs> kind of... Uh, you ever gone to the hard beach? Crust. Yeah, you ever gone to the yes. beach and you find yeah, that, yeah. that sand crust? You, you crunch can, through. Yeah, totally. You crunch through. You could even pick up a sheet of it. Uh, that's exactly what happened uh -huh. on top of my pots. And I was like, that's not good for the for the aeration. So um, pretty interesting. And it is a, a balance. But you are right. Sand fucks up those fungus gnats like no other. Uh, yeah. If you got them bad, that's that's my go-to answer. Especially if you're um if you're not in your final pot. Because the sand will incorporate when you up pot and you, you know right. what I mean? And you get rid of the fungus yes. gnats. But if you're in your final yeah. pot and you got to add this huge thick layer, I that's when I would be careful not to not to have a hard pan yeah, layer or choke out your soil. Yeah, don't go too thick. And it's a good idea to just kind of, you know, every time you water, I like to go with the, my fingers or if you've got one of those uh, little rakes in case you don't like to touch it with your fingers, but just to loosen up the top of the soil the crust ah. so make sure that you're not forming a hard crust like that that can actually like that. repel <laughs> and uh, yeah not let air through and stuff so it just helps to uh, aerate everything mm. make sure your air is blowing yeah you Keeps gotta get little that air. uh things like you know when people start getting algae on top of their soil it's usually easily solved by just breaking up your crust every time you water you don't Start ah. developing weirdly anaerobic, anaerobic little right. microbes about that down. oxygenation. Well, let me ask you this then, because here we go. This is a pest episode, but now we're it's a hybrid episode officially. It's it's pests <laughs> and watering and aeration, which is which is I mean infinitely. We could probably do a hundred hours. Uh, but let, let me related. let me ask you this. I um when I was drenching for the thrips, I was worried about overwatering. I had just up potted recently into a larger pot. So I knew my roots weren't present at all the places. And I wanted to make sure that the soil didn't become anaerobic. And I was worried about overwatering. So you know what I did is I took a bamboo stake. I started to poke aeration holes in the areas where there, I knew there were no roots yet. And that way, you know, it was allowing some air down into that soil. And, and I was hoping that that would uh, prevent that. Now we see this all the time with like grass. 
you're walking in a big uh, open public exactly. field. Yeah, and you see those turds all over the dirt turds all over the all over the floor. <laughs> those are from the aeration guys yeah. coming and poking yeah. holes in the ground. I know it's different because there's multiple plants. They're not a container, yada, yada, yada. It still stimulates the roots. It stimulates yeah. them when you break them. Well, should we be doing that? As, I mean, not should we be. I know be. it sounds like, oh my God, you're damaging my roots. But what you're actually doing is you're just stimulating the growth the same way you when you are when you do your cloning and things. It just, whoosh, it, it doesn't hurt them. It, it's perfectly uh, acceptable and fine. And not what? to worry, you are doing the right thing. You are putting air in there. That's crazy. Plants want air, man. They just want moist air. They don't want dry air. They want moist air. So you definitely don't want soggy. Go ahead and, you know, if you break roots, you're just making new roots, really. I fucking love that. I'm going to bring this up with some other guests <laughs> and, and see, see if we can dig in deeper with this. Because, you know, one thing, Mary Beth, is when people uh, overwater on accident, I usually don't have much to tell them uh, about what to do. There's no, You can't take away water out of that soil. You can't grab a hair dryer. You can't. Start padding it with a paper towel. Well, I guess you probably it's could do those things. Gotta drain, man. <laughs> yeah, you gotta it's gotta find drain. A way to drain that's, if it doesn't have drainage, but boy, you're in trouble. I might poke some holes in in there. Poke to, a hole. What? Right? That would aerate the soil poke nicely, and it would dry yes, nicer. Would. That, that's what I did. I yes. poked all around the perimeter. I put you know eight or ten mm-hmm. holes in the soil. I feel it helped. The plant didn't suffer, did it? That was fine. I mean, the plant. Listen, there you the, go. I've made the the plant was suffering before that. This was this was nothing exactly. at the point. <laughs> There you go, right? So you didn't cause any harm. That's, that positive. is very interesting. Just poke some holes in the in the dirt. Yep. Yep. It works yeah. the same way as like pruning above ground. You know, when you go and prune, you get shoots shooting out all over the place. Same with root pruning. I believe it. Now, you might not want to go right in the center right after you tran. You don't want to hurt the tap root or anything like that. But when you're talking about an Good, established you know. pot. Be reasonable. Yeah, normally yeah, be what's reasonable, done. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you just go straight up and down. You don't, you know, start gashing and stuff like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, right to the center. <laughs> yeah, you know, with a reasonable amount of force and pressure. Okay. And all good intentions. Your plants pick up on your vibe. So, you know, give Tell them, them what love you're doing. while you do these yeah. things. Yeah, talk sweet. Tell them how to go and love it. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's really interesting. I thought there was going to be like, uh, you know, that's good, but but you want to watch the root damage. Nope. Or I thought there was going to be a caveat, nope. but maybe there should be nope. more of us aerating our uh, cannabis soil like we aerate yeah. other other lawns and crops yes, and things. Yes, indeed we do. Oh, shit. Yes, you can. Flat and I'll also tell people if they forget to put their mycorrhiza on after the fact, they can add uh, extra mycorrhiza doing the same thing, poke holes like, with a bamboo stick or something, and then pour your mycorrhizal granules into those little holes, and you're bound to touch uh, uh, roots and to get roots to make contact with that. And it's uh, a good way to do uh, late stage mycorrhizal 1, inoculation. Thousand percent. Yeah, I like this move, especially like you said. Maybe you transplanted and you forgot, so you're it's not right. even fully established yet, but you need to get mycorrhiza in there. And um, when right. I had to do this last time, what I liked to do is I noticed that when you put a bamboo stake down in the pot, for instance, and then you pull it up, unless your soil is very wet, it kind of begins collapsing on itself immediately. So what I do is I get the stake in there and I get a little spoon down at the poke hole while the stick is still in. And I begin pouring it as I kind of lift the stick and pull away. It creates a little bit of a gap and the mycorrhiza falls uh, in as, I don't know, it's kind perfect. of a... Kind of a little specific strategy there, but a I did. A lovely technique. Yeah, from, yeah. So I, I, I try to make that. a little extra room with the stick and then um, mm. p- pour in the mycorrhiza as I lift the stick out so it actually gets down in there. Yeah. My suggestion. Hey, uh, your plant will love you. Yeah, of course. And, and then also I'm, I'm watering with orca as well, the liquid mycorrhiza, but I ideally want both granular and liquid. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. just me. Hey, um, you can't overkill with mycorrhiza as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, baby. That's what I've heard. That's what I've been told. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Let's see. Take a look at the list here. Oh, this was great. Why don't we do one more? One more little point here. Sure. Let's do it. You mentioned uh, when you're talking about the clover mites, their similarity to leaf miners. Mm-hmm. I am interested in leaf miners. Again, this is a pest that I haven't experienced yet. I've never had them in my right. garden. I've seen a couple people in Discord with these types of issues. This is a totally different type of pest, right? And in, in that it's it's mining into your plant matter. Yeah, right into the leaves. And it's another one of those things that, that it's a broad term. There are quite a few species that are known as leaf miners. And so they don't all look alike. Right. But they all do this thing where they mine into the leaf. 
So they actually bore tunnels into the leaves and you'll see these interesting looking curling uh, shapes that look like somebody has drawn pale yellow lines all over your leaves. But those are the where the leaf miners bore in. They're very, very, very tiny, like little worms at that stage. And they're going to want to lay their eggs and, you know, spend as much of their life in that uh, hole that they've mined out as they can. They, you know, similar to the coffee beetle, they're not going to spend their entire life cycle there, but almost their entire life cycle there if they can. So the best way, if you have to fight against any sort of leaf mining species is to get the nematodes on the job because they are the only thing that can really get into those mines as easily as the leaf miner species and to get in there and to just, it, they destroy them, they kill them. Get the predator nematodes that work best in your area and in your climate. And that's usually, if you're going to buy them from somebody like Ar- Arbico, say you're going to go to Arbico Organics and get some nematodes, you can see when you're ordering them if they're the kind that work in your climate. Mm. Now, if you're not sure, I call them on the phone. They're very nice people. But, you know, other companies, I'm sure, will treat you as well. I'm sure there are other companies that sell them. I'm not really advertising for our Beco, but right. there is a they're difference a in nematodes. So I just want to point out that not everyone works as well in some areas as in other areas. So check out the, the environmental preferences of the predator nematodes. But if you've got mining things going on in your leaves they will be destroying your plants as much as they can because they're looking for the same nutrients that you're trying to feed your plants my understanding is you recommend these nematodes and kind of biological attacks because like you said they have to get down into those mines whereas a topical thing yeah like um zymes won't ever really touch them yeah okay it can help to prevent them if they haven't got into the mine yet, but it, you know, it's really not going to be your best bet against leaf miners. If really you want it, you really want to get into those things or any topical, like yeah, yeah, exactly. So with the nematodes, though, I do want to make the point that if you're spraying them, you try to keep it in a as humid a, a situation as you can for yes. as long as possible. Uh, the humidity is really important for the nematodes, so you don't want to be, you know, applying nematodes in the heat of the day or something. If you can do it in the evening or when things aren't going to dry out quickly, they'll have a, t- a chance during while they're still moist and all to go slithering into the mines and <laughs> and getting the uh, leaf miners and taking care of the business. Taking care of business. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those biologicals key again understanding where they live, where they breed and and all of that. Yes. Yeah, and thank goodness there's different kinds cuz boy, you know, not one is not always as good as another. The thing uh, I don't know if you've been getting calls about people with the boring insects. I know somebody in the chat recently had one come up and I ah, doggone it. The uh the caterpillars, you know, the corn borer, I think, and the tomato or those are both a couple of the really bad ones that will just go into your stalks and stems and uh, things like that. The nematodes might be your best bet, but you, there's also people that will literally take a hypodermic needle and inject uh, BT into those holes if they see the holes. <laughs> mm. oh, but, you know, that's one of the things, boy, you better be doing the constant inspection and looking for stuff, but it, you're better off, you know, trying to find some uh, alluring uh, pheromone traps, maybe trap plants, maybe uh, bug sappers, uh, netting, something to prevent that issue because it's so depressing. Mm-hmm. I think the person that pointed it out in chat had just chopped down their plant and noticed it when they chopped that the great big hole, and then the inside of the stalk there had all been like chewed out. Surreal looking uh, again. As someone, I've never done the outdoor thing. I've never had those yeah. pests in my indoor garden. Luckily, um, it looks like you know, yeah. yeah, it looks like a break in on the side of the stalk. It looks like yeah. somebody organized a yeah, uh, Ocean's awful. Eleven style break in, uh-huh. got in the side of the stalk, <laughs> and then they destroy the inside. And yeah, those pictures were um, they were stunning. Done. Exactly, man. You got to, you got to <laughs> fucking <laughs> zip line down that tunnel and destroy the root zone. That's right. Um, I don't know. I don't know what they do, but yeah, um, yeah. Just a shout out to uh, what was that? Pappy. Uh, condolences. Uh, I don't that was. know. Some sad person that breaks your heart every time. Some sad soul. Some oh, beloved member. On it. I should. Uh, I'm pulling it up here. I sh- I should give the proper condolences. I think it was Pappy. <sighs> 
Yeah, it was. Wow. Shout out to Pappy. He's a bay leaf baron. Maybe you know Pappy, him. he's such a good guy. Yeah, he's he always helping the others. It couldn't happen to him. Yeah, the whole NorCal crew. Soul. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tell you what. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> hey, before we wrap it up, shout out to the whole NorCal crew, that travel vlog. By the time you're hearing this, the travel Aww. vlog is probably out. It's definitely out for members. They get early viewing. How fun was that, Mary Beth? We all went out to dinner yep. after with Ari yep. and Rugged and yep. all these. It was so good. Tell you what, man. Next time, no, I'm taking you for Thai food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm there. Thai food for sure. We'll hit Racha Noodle. We'll hit your favorite place. And we'll do uh, back-to-back Thai food dinners. Uh-huh. Uh, awesome. Uh, Mary Beth, we love you. How have I not okay. said it yet? Everybody go follow Mary Beth at MBSIPM. Right. At MBSIPM on Instagram. What else? Stay tuned for the webinars, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you're into it, every once in a while, once a month, we put on a webinar. <laughs> I love it. And uh, just check, check, check the IPM page for that. Uh, you know, it'll tell you the day before or so when, we're, when they're going to happen. Yeah, and if also if you're in membership, I'll be sure to post about that so you'll be alerted to those. Uh, uh, they're yes, through they Dr. Are. Zymes, too. Maybe you follow the amazing yes. Dr. Zymes, yeah, um, who Mary Beth is a big fan of. But most importantly, follow yes. MBS IPM. Most uh, definitely. Growcast, awesome. thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you. It's my pleasure. You keep on rocking the world. You're the best. Absolutely. We'll, <laughs> let, you do, we'll let you do your customary early sign-off, and uh, <laughs> you stay tuned. For a microbiometer hitting your uh, mailbox shortly. Ah, Jordan, thank you so much. Awesome. That is very thoughtful. I really uh, appreciate all right, Mary it. Beth, have a wonderful day. We're gonna have fun with that. You yeah, guys have baby. a good one. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. I love it. Does it get any better than that? No, it does not. Mary Beth is the queen of the Discord. Get on in membership, everybody. Um, you got to try it out. It's so much fucking fun. Or just stay tuned to this podcast for free. I appreciate you so much just for doing that. I hope you learned something today. I know you're going to learn something all throughout this microbe month. So be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Jordan River signing off for Mary Beth Sanchez. Saying be safe and grow smarter. That's our show. That's our show, everybody. No more show. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Mary Beth is the best, isn't she? Doesn't get better than that. Before we wrap it up, AC Infinity, they make the greatest fans. I'm just going to say the greatest tents as well at an affordable price. They make lights. They make everything you need. Code GROWCAST15 saves you 15%. AC Infinity is sexy. You go and you outfit your tent, your new AC Infinity tent, with some fabric pots, with an ion grid, a couple of AC Infinity fans, that is looking sleek. You tired of that old beat up Mars Vivisun tent with all the uh, with all the starlight poking through? You know, you turn off the light outside your grow tent, and you're you're treated to a dazzling array of constellation of pinholes. Yes, there's the Big Dipper. That's not what you want, folks. Yeah, get a sexy new AC Infinity tent. Use code Growcast15. Thank you to AC Infinity. Wonderful partners. Thank you to you listeners. I appreciate you staying subscribed, downloading every episode. You mean the world to me. If you are interested, jump into membership. Would love to see you there. Or just continue listening to the show. I look forward to bringing you more cultivation knowledge each and every week. That's all for now, everybody. Best of luck in your garden and in life. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.